Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to the Book of Acts Now Global Church and Global School and Global Ministries. Praise God. We're sending out teachings, uh, ministries to uh, several nations every week, and we're thankful that God is moving in a mighty way. So as we uh, give call today for our work of God to be done in this place, we pray that it'll be done in your place today also as you join in with us. So join with us today. We want to see the book of Acts still written, and the book of Acts is still written. There's no formal ending to the book of Acts. It's still being written today by the God of all heaven, Yahweh. Hallelujah. And he's wanting to write, and you need to rise up and let him write the book of Acts through you. We need to see signs, wonders, miracles. We need to see a mighty move of God wherever we go because he is moving in us. He's moving in his people. So today we invite you to join in as we worship him, lift him up, and we hear from the word of God today. Hallelujah. So right now, Pastor, Pastor, Apostle, and Dr. Jerry Bowers is coming to preach the word of God to us today. So receive what he has for you today. Amen. Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom. Good to see everybody here today. Great summer in Texas, which means it's hot. But we're blessed. Amen. Yes, hallelujah. We are blessed. Today we are continuing a series on the life of Christ. I just feel like God has been speaking to me about the importance of making the reality of the gospel center and centrally focused. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news. That's what it means, good news. But what? it's the good news about what? It's the good news about the life of Christ and what he came to do. And so what... You know, one of the concerns that I have is that there's a problem with the microphone. Me, I think. All right, the better. Good. One of the problems that we have in Christendom is that there are so many topics and so many things that you can be focused on. That sometimes, while there are good things we can talk about, they're not the most important things. How many agree the most important thing is to know Christ? Yeshua. And so we're going to spend um, a couple of months taking a look at the life of Christ and who he was and why he came and what he did because we need to have the plumb line of heaven back in the church today and how many know that Christ is the plumb line of heaven and so we're going to continue with a series today um, encounters with Christ encounters with Jesus we're going to talk about Jesus the healer now I have a vision um, and I just believe in God's going to make it happen that we're going to have a radio program called Jesus the healer Yeshua the healer because the Bible says that he came to bring good news to the poor, the afflicted, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to heal the sick, let prisoners go free, open blind eyes. That's why he came. And guess what? Contrary to what some people teach, he's still the same healing Savior. He still is coming to do the same work he did when he walked this earth. And so we want to reintroduce him to uh, our church and to those who are listening. The healing Jesus. The healing Yeshua. Let me ask you a question. I'm just going to reflect on something that God spoke to me. Do you know him? Do you know Christ? 
Well, you know, I know all about the, uh, the history tells me that he came, he died, he was in a tomb, and he rose again and he ascended. No, I ask you, did you know, do you know him? Just give, give me the facts, ma'am. You can know the facts, but, you, but not know him. Do you know that in his day that believers had memorized the Bible for their day, the Old Testament, the Torah, they had memorized whole parts of it, but they didn't know God. It's possible to know about him and to know doctrine, but not know him. Well, wait, wait a minute, Pastor. I know about all the end-time prophecies. I've studied about the Antichrist. I can tell you all about the Antichrist and how to find him. Yeah, but that's not what I ask you. Do you know him? There are people today, you, you ask them this question, and they, they will tell you, wait, I know about all the prophecies of the last days. And I can tell you the timelines, and I can tell you what's coming, and what we're expecting next, but that's not what I ask you. Do you know him? This is something that every believer needs to be able to answer. You can know about him, but not know him. You could be involved in religion, but not know him. As such was the case in Christ's day, the religious leaders did not really know God. There were many, such as Zacchaeus, who, were, who felt excluded from the religion of the day. In fact, they weren't allowed to attend the church. If you were a leper, prostitute, tax collector, or if you had any maladies, imperfections. You know that even if a person, this is in the Old Testament, if you had acne, you couldn't sing in the choir. And so the people who most needed God were excluded and didn't feel welcome at church. There's a, that's a lot of that going on today. And so Zacchaeus, you see, he begins to hear the stories about how God is real. But he still felt like he was an outsider, always on the outside looking in, hearing about things but not feeling like it was for him. There are many today, even who go to church, who feel like they're on the outside looking in. They hear about stories of how people hear from God, how people experience God, how God is real. But to them, he's never been real. And so God wants to move us from being an observer like Zacchaeus to a participant. And this is the story of Zacchaeus' life. Moving from being an observer to a participant and experiencing God's love. Experiencing restoration and transformation in his life. The story of Zacchaeus is found in Luke chapter 19. A man who was without hope and shut out. But then he began to hear stories and testimonies about this new rabbi, Yeshua HaMashiach. And how that Jesus, Yeshua, was accepting the people who weren't welcome. My, my. If you were a prostitute, he was known to actually touch them and pray for them and love them and heal them. And then they changed. He was known to reach out to other tax collectors who were condemned by the religious leaders and they became his followers. Wow. And so as he heard these things, hope began to spring into his own heart that maybe, maybe there was still a chance for him. Hope. One day, Zacchaeus overhears others talking about that Yeshua is coming to town. In fact, he's going to be speaking in the public square, out in the open. You don't have to worry about going into church where you're not welcome. He'll be out on the street speaking, and you can hear him. And so Zacchaeus makes up his mind, listen, maybe there is hope. Maybe there's a truth to what I've been hearing. I'm going to go and listen and, and find out, is this real? Is God real? And you know what hope will do in a person's heart? Hope will give birth to faith. And so the crowd is already forming. Now, Zacchaeus, he was short in stature. He had been ridiculed and teased in his childhood, rejected and judged by others. So he got so angry, he decided to exact revenge on the people 
in that community who had hurt him, and he discovered a good way to do it. If you become a tax collector and you're angry with some folks, you get to decide what they pay and how much. And so with his enemies, it's like, okay, you're going to pay four times what's due. No, 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 you can't argue with me. The Roman governor will be down here with some soldiers and take you up, take you in. You're going to pay. You're going to pay, man. You're going to pay because of what you did to me. And so he was exacting revenge and anger and bitterness. But you know what? It left him empty. It didn't help. How many know if you live in anger and resentment towards other people, you live as a victim of your past and not in freedom and not in love? And so he had come to the point where the revenge thing wasn't working too good for him anymore. And so he sees the crowd joined uh, up ahead. And so he decides as he gets up there, he can't see. He can't see over the people because they're taller than he is. So he sees the direction that Christ is going, and he makes up his mind, I'm going to run ahead of this group, of the speaker, Looks like they're headed in that direction, you know, kind of southeast. I'm going to run ahead of them and find a vantage point where I can see. So he climbs up a sycamore tree. How many know that that was an act of faith when he did that? Because hope had given birth to faith. He wanted to hear and see Jesus. He wanted to understand, is he, is he everything people are saying that he is? You know, the Bible says when you seek after him with your whole heart, he will be found of you. And so Christ knew that he was in that tree. And he made sure that he came that direction. So can you imagine as he's getting closer? Zacchaeus is sitting in the tree. His heart is beginning to pound faster and faster. Because he sees that the great rabbi is moving his direction. He can hear his voice. And the more he hears the voice and, and what he's preaching about the love of God. And how about it? It's not about religion. It's about what's in the heart that counts. And God is looking on the heart and not just at people, even what they're dressing or eating. That's not what defiles a person. It's what's in the heart. He's listening to all of this. His heart is warmed. And then the master, can you believe it? The master comes right under the tree Zacchaeus is sitting in. He stops and he looks up and he says, hello, Zacchaeus. It's like, how you know my name? Let me tell you something. He knows all of our names. And he knows about us. And he still wants to come our way. If we will just get that vantage point. Come on. Get that vantage point where you're making yourself available for God. You want to have an encounter. You want to know him. You're seeking after him. And he will come your way. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree. I'm going to abide with you in your house today. Now, this was both a good and a bad declaration. This was good for Zacchaeus. It made him feel like about 10 feet tall because a famous rabbi like this would normally be expected to go to the house of the dignitaries in that town. The mayor, governor, the most important person in the city. That's where he would go. So really what, what Christ was saying to him, today, Zacchaeus, I know that the, that the synagogue and the religious leaders see you as unfit and unworthy and they won't let you come to church. But let me tell you something. I'm going to make you the most important man in town. I'm coming to your house. You see, people might look down on you and not believe in you. They might talk about you. But when Christ stands up for you and he is the one who blesses you, can't nobody stop it or turn it back. And so he goes, he says he, you know, he's going to go there. And so Zacchaeus can't believe what is happening. He took the first step towards understanding how real God is. He wanted to see Jesus. That's what prayer does. We may not have a sycamore tree, but you can climb into God's presence through prayer, and you can begin to seek his face and tarry before him and ask him to reveal himself to you. Get in the Word. Get in His presence. Worship Him. And as you seek Him with all your heart, He'll come your way. And you'll find yourself in your own sycamore tree experiencing the presence of God. Amen? 
he moved from being a casual observer to one who was experiencing and encountering the living God. Wow. And so there was a response. He said, he stood up and he said, Lord, I'm going to give half of all my goods to the poor. Now, now Christ didn't ask him to do anything. But he was convicted by the love and the mercy of God. And that conviction about God and his mercy caused him to realize he hadn't shown mercy. He wanted to make that right. And giving back the stolen goods was a way of restoring mercy. And restoring mercy in his own life was going to transform him. Nobody told him to do that. You get a taste of the mercy of God, you'll start becoming merciful. Amen? And so he goes on to say, and if I've stolen or taken anything from anybody, I'll give four times back what I took. Now, now get a load of this. He's been around for quite some time. He probably has a lot of wealth because he's been taken from people for a long time. So this is a tall order. He's going to go back to everybody he took more from, exacted taxes from that he shouldn't. He's going to give them back four times. So he shows up at your door, knocks on the door. You're like, oh, no, he's back for more money. And he's like, no, 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 uh, listen, I came to repent. You know, Rabbi Yeshua, he, he's changed my heart. I realize I needed God's forgiveness. He gave me his mercy, and now I've got to make things right. So I brought $10,000 to give to you for everything I've ever taken. Not only that, I want to give you four times what I took. I took $10,000 from you, but I'm going to give you $40,000. If, if he's knocking at your door, you're like, did I hear, did I hear right? Is, is this the tax collector that we've all known come to fear and, and hate? Are, are you that guy? And he's going to say, no, I'm not that guy no more. I've been changed because the mercy of God visited me. Oh, hallelujah. You know what? We can react to people who harm us and hurt us tit for tat and give them back what they deserve because that's what Zacchaeus was doing. Or we can understand the mercy of God and how the mercy of God can change us and the world around us. That's why Christ said, do good to those who persecute you and pray for those who do evil against you. Why? Because it'll change the world. Anybody can hate the neighbor who hates you and hate him back. Well, what happens if you respond with kindness and prayer and you do good to them? You start releasing the mercy that changes people. And God backs it up with his own blessings. And you find that no longer do you have the hatred in your heart. Amen? Wow. Praise God. What the world needs today is the revelation of the living God. And we need to learn how to make him real. Now, I didn't say how to make your doctrine real. I didn't say how to make your belief system real. It's about a person. The Bible says, and this is eternal life, that you might know the one and only true God and His Son whom He has sent. That's eternal life, to know Him. So I ask you today, and those listening online, do you know Him? You know, there was a time at Caesarea Philippi when, when Christ asked the disciples, Who do men say that I am? And it was Peter who said, Thou art the Son of the living God. And Christ said, Man, flesh, and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father did. But at that point, did Peter really know him? He knew about him enough to know who he was, but he didn't know him. He later denied him. It wasn't until Christ returned to the Sea of Galilee after his resurrection and found Peter there. Peter had denied him three times. He felt that above all of the disciples, he had denied him. And he wasn't worthy to be a disciple. He was defeated. He was hanging out 
with the other fishermen because all he knew to do was fish. But he felt himself to be a failure. Ever feel like you've blown it? And so Christ made a special visit there, and he said, Peter, I have a question for you. Do you love me? Lord, you know that I do. No, 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 Peter. Peter, do you love me? Yeah. You know, the tendency was to say, I love every, love you more than anybody else, because that was his prideful spirit. But the third time he asked the question, it melted Peter's heart. Peter looked him in the eye. Peter, do you really? He said, Lord, even you know that I do. And they said, Peter, I'm going to tell you something. My calling isn't based on your worthiness or how you esteem yourself as greater than somebody else. My calling for you is based on my mercy and my love. And out of that position, go feed my sheep what you learned from me right now. Go give them that love. Go give them that mercy. I'm restoring you, Peter. You denied me three times, and now I've had you confess me three times. I'm canceling out the denial. I'm canceling out your failures, and I'm, commi- I'm calling you, Peter, because my mercy doesn't run out. Now you go feed my sheep. You don't feed them from out of that place of pride. You feed them from out of that place of knowing my mercy. I can remember as a, a Bible student having an internship in a church. And they asked me to go visit some names. They gave me some names. And one of those, the guy's name was John, was an alcoholic. And I remember going to see him and not knowing for sure what I would do, but I, I, I stuck a Bible study in my Bible just in case on the return of Christ because I knew that pretty good and, and I could give him a good doctrinal study. And so I showed up and he lived in what might be referred to as a flop house. Now that's, that's a place that's it's run down, dirty place. They charge them just a small amount every night by the, by the day to, live, to sleep there. You know, maybe it's 10 bucks a night. It's a flop house. I went up the stairs, and when I got up there, the hallway was dimly lit. And the first thing you know, my flesh starts to take control. I'm like, there's holes on the wall. There's graffiti on the wall. There's some bad people here. You know what? Somebody could pop out of one of these doors and take my wallet. And his, wouldn't you know, his room was all the way at the end of the hallway. I'm like, Lord, help me, angels, please. So I get down to the end of the hallway and knock on the door, and here, and John opens the door, bloodshot eyes. Oh, Pastor, you're you're here. Yeah, John, I came to see you. Can I come in? Yeah, come in, come in. So we chat a little bit, and I said, uh, you know, I just want to share the Bible with you. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. So I started doing one of these lessons. I have memorized. I knew where all the verses were, uh, all the proof texts about the soon return of Jesus, of Christ, that he's coming back. We need to get ready. About halfway through that, he stopped me. He said, Pastor, excuse me. I've been an alcoholic for 26 years. Haven't been able to stop. I've lost my wife, my job, my children, and this is what I have left. Unless you have something you can tell me to help me get out of this, you wasted your time. Wow, boy, did that... Gee. I wasn't making him relevant to that man. I was just showing up with a doctrine. When we witness or share Christ with somebody, we need to take the time to connect with them relationally, find out what their needs are, because Christ always met people at the point of their greatest need. And so if we just try to give them what we know, and we're not, we're not matching it up and connecting it with their needs, we're going to miss out on really reaching it so i just kind of swallowed my pride and i said john i'm an intern i'm just learning i'd like to pray about what you asked me this week and come back and and give it another try next week is that okay john he said yeah so i came back the next week and the lord spoke that text to me this is eternal life that you might know the one and only true god and his son 
And I felt like the Lord said to me, Tell him what I did for you. You know, it's not just the facts that people need to know. They need to know he's real. And when you share what he's done in your life, that's a testimony. That's a witness. So we visited and I said, John, listen. God gave me a text I want to share with you. And then I want to share with you what he did for me. He said, this is eternal life. To know the one and only true God and his son. There was a time in my life when I didn't know him. I knew about him, but I didn't know him. John, I was a Marine for almost nine years. And during that time, I did a lot of things. I drank. was addicted to alcohol and cigarettes. And, but my worst addiction was my language. And so when I came to Christ, he took, he took away alcohol. My dad was an alcoholic, and whenever I would drink, boy, I'd just get wasted. That was a generational curse. And my dad smoked, and so I smoked too. Not only that, back then in the Marines and the military, when you got your sea rations, your meal, uh, cigarettes came in the meal. And so, guess what? Guys in World War II and Vietnam and Korea, many of them got on cigarettes because the government gave them to them. Thank God he got me off all that. But I said, John... I really struggled with life. I couldn't change my language. And then the enemy would beat me up and he'd say, you can't be a Christian. Look at you. You foul mouth Marine. And so I got discouraged and I thought, well, I can't change. Maybe, maybe that's true. Maybe I can't be a Christian. I saw, I cried out to God in prayer. I said, God, if you want to change me, you have to do it. I don't want to be this way anymore. I want to be changed. It was like, like a voice came down from heaven and said, You hard-headed Marine, don't you know you can't change who you are? A leopard cannot change his spots. Only I can change you. And then this text God gave me. James 4, 7 said, Submit yourself to God and resist the devil and he must flee. And so it was so bad I could just be walking in nature on a beautiful day and and bad language would just go through my mind. Now, where was that coming from? It was coming from the devil. He was trying to bring me back into his kingdom because I had made a commitment to Christ. And so I began to use James 4, 7. No, I don't receive this. I submit to God. I'm a child of God. I'm a believer in Christ. And I tell these thoughts to leave my mind. And they would begin to leave. I would resist. And you know, it got less and less and less until it stopped. It was a battle. Sometimes God will give us an instant victory over something, and sometimes there's a war. Anybody having a war? I said, God, how come? How come you can't just set me on that mountain of victory over there? I got to go through the battle and go through the valley and go through the fire, briar bushes and go through the thorns. And have this terrible battle in this area of my life. Because he said, son, if you don't learn how to trust me in the valley, you're never going to be victorious. I said, John, I believe this same Jesus who delivered me from foul language and from impure thoughts. This same Jesus can deliver you from alcohol. If you'll submit your will to him. I said, John, I'm going to tell you something. If you submit your will to him, he is the greatest will in the universe, the greatest power in the universe. You align your will with him. You can do anything through Christ who strengthens you. Would you be willing to try that out, John? He said, this is what I've been wanting to hear. You mean you didn't like my doctrinal study? It wasn't relevant to where he was. And so we knelt there in his dingy dungy, filthy, rented room. And we submitted ourselves to God and asked Him to free him from alcohol addiction and align His will. He said, I'm willing. I led Him in a prayer. Lord, I'm willing to align my will with Yours. I want to be free. I don't want to be this man anymore. I want You to deliver me from the power of alcohol. 
And I resist that alcohol right now. Lord, remove it from me. Oh, hallelujah. Whatever you struggle with, wherever your battles are, align your will with him and submit to him. Tell him you don't want it. Tell him you want deliverance. Tell him to take fear out of your life and set you free and put perfect love in you. We got done praying. Amen. Old John got up. Kind of a big guy. I'm glad I didn't take him off. He's bigger than me. I was a lot slimmer back then. You know. He walked. <coughs> he walked over to the refrigerator, opened the door. Now my dad drank cheap wine, so I recognize cheap wine when I see it. It's called port wine. And he went over there and he got this out. Held it up, about half a gallon of wine. Walked over to the sink, opened the bottle. I didn't tell him to get rid of the wine. Come on now. Zach, nobody told Zacchaeus to get rid of his problems, but the mercy kicked in. And he went over to the sink and dumped that the half a gallon of wine down the sink. Put the empty bottle in the trash. He said, I believe, Pastor that from this night on, I'm getting set free. So we walked down. I said, walk me out, John, because I'm thinking, I need a bodyguard getting out of here. <laughs> so John, the man who's been set free from alcohol, walks me out down the hallway. we down to the street, and it's dark. There's a street light. We get down to the street light, and here comes this woman. This is along the Napa River in California. Here comes... This woman towards us walking along the pathway there, and she's screaming. And she gets closer, she's cussing me and cursing me. Now, God delivered me from bad language, and here comes a demonic woman cursing me and cussing. That's the enemy's not happy with that night of what's going on, right? I'm, I'm just, I'm like, God, I'm only an intern, you know? <laughs> He has a sense of humor. Come on. So, Lord, what am I supposed to do? Is this woman going to come up here and pull a knife and attack me? You know what? Maybe she's going to take my wallet. You know? We have to be careful. The flesh will kick in if you're not careful. Now, Lord, help me. What do I? He said, just, just declare peace to her spirit. So as she walked to me and got closer in earshot, I looked at her and pointed, and I said, Peace to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. Boom. She stopped in her tracks. She was wearing a goat head around her neck, which is a symbol of Satanism. And she, sh like, shook herself, and, and she, the real person came back. And she said, I just came from this meeting where they're worshiping Satan. I don't know why I went there. I don't want to do this. She's in the presence of mercy. Come on now. Mercy's been manifested in John. She's in the presence of mercy. And, and nobody has to tell her to repent. The mercy does it. Come on, I'm talking to you about how to witness. Oh, hallelujah. She takes off that goat head. I didn't tell her to. I just said, peace to you. She takes off the goat head, throws it in the Napa River, and says, I don't want this anymore. I want to know about Jesus. You know what grace is? It's mercy on display. That night, I learned about how to be a real pastor. I learned that it's not about giving somebody your doctrine, giving them the right proof text, giving them the theology you think is important for the day. Come on now. Give them God's mercy and give them Christ. This is eternal life, that they might know the one and only true God and His Son who Him sent. And when you do that and mercy begins to call, come in, the love of Christ begins to be put on display, they're going to change. They're going to repent. And they're going to get transformed in the presence. See, this is the great need today. We need the presence of God to come back into our lives. We need to walk in that presence. 
You know what? You get on up in the sycamore tree and spend some time in the glory realm and spend some time in the presence of God in the chamber. Come on. That's why it says, and I'm going to start preaching. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, come confidently before the throne of grace that you might receive grace and mercy to help in time of need. And apply that to somebody's need. Tell them what it's done for you. People start repenting and throwing goat heads in the water, throwing alcohol down the sink, and turn it to God. Oh, hallelujah! Because mercy and grace are flowing like a river. Somebody said, Pastor, you need to preach more about how to witness. Well, that's what I'm doing. It's not about how much you know the doctrine you think you know. It's about Him. Give Him to somebody. You know, the Lord said this to me. I've been sharing with people about the Book of Acts course that we have. The Book of Acts Ministry School. And I've told them, I said, look, God wants us to see the Book of Acts for today. Oh, hallelujah, we want the signs and wonders and miracles. Hallelujah. I preached in Africa. Hallelujah. But the first thing you're going to do, the first course for the whole first year you're going to study about the life of Christ, and you'll see the signs and wonders and miracles, but you're going to spend a whole year with him. And it's like deer in the headlight, huh? We, we want the miracles. And here's what God said to me. It's arrogant to think that you can go into the book of Acts and have signs and wonders and miracles without the miracle giver Christ. You've got to know him. You've got to walk with Him. You've got to know His mercy and His grace and be one who walks in it before you can see the signs and wonders. And so if you want, that's what unlocks the anointing in the book of Acts. I'm telling you the truth. In fact, if you really get acquainted with the life of Christ, you begin to see that what they're doing in the book of Acts is, is that they're re- representing what they saw him do at the gate beautiful when the man who's never walked is lame sitting there they remember what he did at the pool of bethesda with the lame man who never walked and how he healed him and what he said and what he did and so the holy spirit had them say and do the kind of things they saw christ do and they got the same results i might start preaching And so you need to know his life and what he did, have his same heart, his same love, his same grace and mercy. So when Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto you, what was he giving to him? It wasn't just healing. He was releasing, come on, Peter at the Sea of Galilee had experienced the reality of God's mercy when he had been forgiven and restored and he knew the power that mercy could restore a man's heart could restore a man's life, could restore a man's walk with God, but mercy could also restore a man's legs. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto you. You can walk, sir, because the same God of mercy cares and loves you as much as he loved me, and he sent me to be a, mer a messenger of that mercy. Therefore, such as I have that God downloaded in me, I release. Give me your hand, sir. I'm going to release that to you right now. Get up. But if you haven't encountered him and you haven't learned about that mercy and you don't know about entering the glory realm and being in his presence and walking in that, you can speak all you want. Nothing will happen. And so therefore, those who want to understand and the book of Acts church or the book of Acts ministry school how to minister like he did, you've got to go spend time with him. That's why we're going to do a whole series on preaching on the life of Christ, Yeshua, so that we can begin to have that anointing. And we can do the things in the book of Acts that the disciples did, but it's a positional thing. You do it not out of head knowledge. You do it out of the experience of knowing him and walking with him and then you can say, such as I have. Come on, there's shalom in me because I got shalom at the cross. And I got deliverance at the cross. I got some grace. I got some forgiveness. Oh, hallelujah. I know what freedom looks like because I saw it up close. And such as I have, I release it unto you. 
be set free now in His name, and they'll get free. I'm preaching to somebody. This needs to come back to the church. And this same God will operate through us and do the same things in the book of Acts. Hallelujah. Mike, I'm going to make a call. I'm going to ask you today. We spent some time before tearing in the presence of God, asking for revelation. But now he's given you some new revelation. And I'm wondering if some of us are thirsty. You know, Zach, Zacchaeus got thirsty. The religion of his day wasn't quite doing it. And he said, I'm going to climb that tree. I want to get into God's presence. I want to see him. I want to hear from him. I want what he has. If that's you today, and you're willing to climb the sycamore tree, I want you to get up and come up here. You know, Christ always asked people to respond to when he made an offer. By faith. Lord, we don't have a sycamore tree. But we want to say to you, we want to know you. We want to know your grace, your mercy. We want to know your transformation. We want to be able to walk in it so that we can say what Peter said, such as I have, I give unto you. God, I'm asking that you'll honor those at this altar today. You'll honor them. By beginning to give that revelation and breakthrough in each of our lives. Me too, Lord. I want to know the height and depth and breadth of your love and grace.